you know, can I ask us to thank these incredible, <laughs> incredible, I thank you so much. We all thank you so much. This is a beautiful um, uh, uh, library of wisdom and knowledge. So uh, I'm going to get off the stage. I'm going to come down and uh, facilitate your questions. Uh, who would like to ask something of our illustrious panel? Austin. I tried to write it down so I wouldn't ramble on. So here it is. Uh, many years ago, I saw a therapist and laid out all my issues on the first day. And he simply looks at me very simply and says, oh, you're a seeker. Uh, now I feel I'm sitting in a room of seekers, and when we all indulge in whatever mushroom or LSD or ayahuasca or whatever it is, we usually start out with a goal, but then, there takes, then, but then this trip takes on its own path. After all, it's not the trip you want, but the trip you need. This conference, I've been hearing some common themes such as open up your heart and give and receive love, but also a sense of opening up and communicating as well, then I have dot, 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 speak from the heart. <laughs> Um, so my question is, I've noticed focusing on how the process of the experiences works seems to dampen the mystical experience itself. When I'm trying to figure out how it works, I lose it. <laughs> um, but uh, when having this higher entity or vibe of getting to know this higher power, uh, and it teaches us so much, but yet remains elusive on how it works. I get the feeling that it's like a baby monitor, that we're really not supposed to know how it works. We're only supposed to receive, but not send up. <laughs> uh, after all, if anybody could do it, uh, people would be going, hey, what kind of car should I buy? <laughs> so my question to you is, um, do you ever get the sense that we are not allowed to know how these experiences work? <laughs> uh, just, just the last part. Are we not supposed to know how these things work? How are, uh, are we supposed to? Are we not supposed to know? Are we not allowed? Are we not allowed? Well, no, I don't get that sense. You know, I'm a godless scientist. <laughs> Our job is to, is to find out. These are very sacred, but that doesn't mean that they're restricted territory. I mean, by, by, you know, by, by eliciting human curiosity and making us wonder how do these things work? That's a way of honoring them. You know, the inquisitiveness of the human mind is a lot of what the uh, psychedelics are about. They make us wonder about the world and make us want to understand it. So it's totally legitimate to do whatever you I, I think part of what you might be referring to is the quality of in, ineffability that, it's, that their words don't describe. And this goes back to the, what is the finger pointing to the moon is not the moon. And so there's a certain um, acknowledgement of the ineffability that I think you're referring to in your question. Other comments from the panel? I think um, we, find that we find this process out, we find out the answers to these things if we have those questions and if we, if we are looking for the answers to them over and over. And that it's very, those answers may be very different for each Sorry. person. And this is an answer not so much from science but from, <clears throat> from, uh, from the hallways of personal experience. So. I believe there are many ways of knowing and that sometimes when I go into a ceremony my intention is please help me to see differently. So I feel like there's a process of purification and realignment that needs to happen even to know the mystery in a different way. So I feel like it's a, it's a journey and some may realize certain things in some ways and some may realize certain things in another way. Uh, I, 
would also like to add, I think as Dennis mentioned earlier, that um, we're kind of like the monkeys, and uh, so we don't necessarily uh, have ne the capabilities to grasp the mysterium tremendum, the great mystery, uh, you know, the numinous, and we use these words because um, we can't necessarily grasp them in the way that uh, makes sense to our, our intellects, perhaps, but uh, the reason that we are looking there is because there seems to be something of great value, and it's our job to continue to uh, figure out as much as we can by doing the science, by doing the research that we're doing. So. I'd like to add that, you know, if, if all is one, then what's, what part of us, of all, is not allowing us to know? Um, any other questions for the panel? <laughs> During this conference, you have all discussed different psychedelic substances that are beneficial for healing. Can any of you speak about ketamine and if it's beneficial in that way as well? Did you hear the question? Is ketamine also uh, therapeutically useful? Yes? <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, it, it is. All of these things, you know, uh, was with any drug, it's all, or anything else we interact with that's not us, it's how you use it that makes the difference. But I am certainly no expert on ketamine, but there's been a lot of work recently that shows that ketamine is very effective for treating depression when nothing else will. And it sparked a whole uh, bunch of research about looking at different mechanisms, neurochemical mechanisms that, uh, that cause depression. And out of that, the, uh, you know, the, the sort of 5-HT uh, imbalance that is the model for most of the SSRIs is, begin is beginning to be questioned. And it's kind of clear that maybe that's not the right way to look at this. So ketamine is useful in that way that I know of. It's being used clinically. Unfortunately, it actually can be used clinically because it's not a Schedule One substance, unlike most of these things that we're talking about. So therapists that want to do psychedelic therapy can potentially use ketamine and not be uh, breaking any laws when they do that. Uh, yeah, actually, as a matter of fact, uh, there's a paper out of Columbia University not more than two months ago, I don't think, uh, showing that uh, cocaine-dependent individuals uh, who are not actually trying to stop using cocaine, but who are given infusions of ketamine, uh, were showing less craving and less use. Uh, and so, yeah, there's definitely some clinical implications here besides the work of Kropinski and the other uh, researchers who are looking at use of uh, ketamine, which really does seem to help people um, when uh, they're having this very acute suicidal depression. So um, obviously it needs to be researched more. I don't ever recommend or refer. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> no, seriously, your question is, is what now? <laughs> I'm telling you, the acoustics here are terrible. That's Where should one go to experience ayahuasca? Is that what you were asking, sir? Yes. But oh, you want a recipe? <laughs> no, he wants a referral. No, we're not giving out references here. You, you, you got to find that on your own. We, you know, we. <laughs> uh, there's plenty of information out there. There's this thing called Google. You might have heard of it. <laughs> Work with that. Hold on. Mr. You've had a lot of experience with ayahuasqueros in your life. 
Who would you say stood out in your life as a great Iowa Scarrow? Uh, I, I don't want to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I don't want to endorse particular Iowa Scarrows. Uh, there are good ones and there are bad ones, and you've got to kind of work your way through the network. Don't uh, accept the first offer on the way in from the airport once you get to a key dose. <laughs> That's probably not the guy you want, you know. Uh, it helps if you kind of know the, the 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 territory a little bit and do a little uh, do, do a little research. But uh, you know, I don't feel like I probably share that with everyone here. I don't feel like I want to recommend anybody because the next thing you know, I'll recommend somebody, and it turns out they're a complete scoundrel and charlatan, and it's always. It, you know, and that's disappointing when that happens, and it has happened. So, uh, does anyone else on the panel have a specific Iowa Scarrow they would like to recommend? <laughs> I, the, the main, the main thing I'd say is that we get asked that a lot, uh, not necessarily for specifically for ayahuasca, but for uh, you know, sort of cactus shamans or. Uh, or uh, there's a lot of people who try, are trying very hard to find ibogaine uh, therapy, uh, and there's in Costa Rica and in Mexico and in some some in South America and some in Africa and some in Europe and some in the Caribbean um, doing ibogaine and uh, doing ibogaine therapy. And there's a lot of problems. I mean, what we we end up Arrowhead ends up being kind of a hub for people complaining about train wrecks that have happened and. You know, there's you know deaths and arrests and uh, very very bad experiences, and it's it's hard to, to recommend any any specific thing. It's a little bit like recommending brands of you know kind of underground or illegal drugs that aren't really regulated, and we get it. it it's it's a very difficult question because um, there's the issue that that uh, that Dennis talked about, but there's also just. Um, <laughs> We, we actually, well, one of the things that Arrowwood deals with in terms of managing experience reports and stories people tell us is that there's intentional fraud um, that is uh, built into the kind of the baseline data stream uh, that is, there's a commercial interest in promoting people. And so we get, we get stories about ayahuasca arrows or uh, ibogaine therapy centers um, that are paid for by the, the, the people involved in, in getting profit from those. And so it's a, it's a, it's a very difficult problem, and we don't exactly know how to handle it, other than just sort of being conservative about recommending that you talk to your friends um, and ask ask around. That's your your best bet. Okay, I have a question here for the panel. Is there any evidence that there are people who have experienced hallucinogenic experiences? through communication by critical mass. Is there any evidence that people have had a hallucinogenic experience through communication by critical mass? Through communication by critical mass. Ah, we have someone who understands the question. Is that, is that <laughs> like the hundredth monkey? You, you mean like a contact high kind of situation? Like, no. like he's saying, like the, the the hundredth monkey. I think he's communication by spir spiritual mass, and the best example is the hundredth monkey. I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I critical mass. Uh, I, I, my one, I don't know. I don't know if I have an exactly an, an answer for that. But I, I, there's no question that uh, sort of psychedelic uh, slash spiritual energies can kind of reverberate around other people who are having those experiences. And even my own experience, um, days before or days after an experience, is sort of it's it's a curious. I'm, I'm a little bit of a, a skeptic and a hardhead, and and yet I feel oftentimes like. I'm tripping a day before I actually take something, and sort of a, that's not, um, it's not exactly what you were asking, but I mean, it seems, seems like probably the answer is yes, that, that especially for sensitive people, that, um, 
I mean, I, I think it's common to people to report like cats and their dogs and things like that behaving strangely uh, during while well, well, they're tripping. And so um, I don't see why sensitive people would be any different. Yeah, actually, um, the thing that I thought of when I heard your question was uh, a study that one of my professors did, uh, Dr. Arthur Hastings, and um, he took a bunch of people who had already experienced MDMA and then he put them under a sort of hyp hypnotic, light hypnotic trance in a group and um, asked them to go back to that place and many of them reported the ability to kind of uh, re-enter that altered state of consciousness and so it does seem like uh, there's some group energy stuff that can go on in that situation that doesn't necessitate a drug per se. Well that throws physics on its head, doesn't it? Um, another question here for the panel. So that's uh, actually kind of interesting what just happened because I have a very related question that I've been dying to ask for a while now. Um, I heard a really incredible story uh, a couple months ago that pretty much brought me to my knees. You know, I don't know if it's true, but it's very interesting. Uh, it was about a man who uh, synthesized his own DMT and for extended periods of time, time, months at a time, all he did was smoke DMT. He was always on it for just profound amounts of time. And yeah, yeah, it's coming. Um, and people who sat next to him and who would be around him said that they could feel the DMT energy coming off of him and radiating off of him because he had smoked so much. So my question is, what are your thoughts on that? Is it possible? Uh, if it is possible, uh, what's the mechanism? How does it work? And what can we learn about DMT from these kinds of case studies? The, the world is very strange. <laughs> I don't know if there's any sort of scientific precedent for looking at that in a, in a structured way, but certainly anecdotally, um, the Indian Vedanta teacher Sri Ramana Maharshi um, was well known for putting people into quote-unquote non-dual states um, just by being in his presence, and that's said about a number of different spiritual teachers, but uh, uh, it's probably a similar mechanism if, if it is uh, you know, something that's ac actually true. So. I believe it's helpful to remember that we're always hosting and connecting to these energies. So at the beginning, when I asked you to meditate with whatever you have taken in, you are continually tapped into that energy and at any moment with intention and quietening, focusing, you can ask questions, you can relate to someone else. When we get really sensitive, like through the plant diets, you can actually smell the DMT on people or other plants. That, like our bodies are continually talking to each other so I, I do believe that it's possible and that actually it's a, it's a goal of mine in particular to be that sensitive and be able to navigate those energies wisely another question miss um, before when we were talking about um, plant dieting and um, the plant spirits for I was wondering if there was a way to get in touch with that relationship to plant teachers in a way that's more integrated without just fully dieting with a plant repeat the question um, I was wondering if there was a way to get more get in touch with the relationship to the plant teachers in a way that's more integrated without just fully dieting with a plant. Not solely dieting. You, you mean like without going someplace special and dieting for a particular period of time, but having it in your life? It is that. Yeah, I, I, can, I can speak to, to some of what I think you're asking about is I had a someone come into my office who had only heard of uh, ayahuasca. He hadn't read anything about it or experienced it. He just, you know, that very first step of hearing from a friend. And he asked me if I knew anything about it. And I, in my office, I've always had this practice of uh, being very honest. 
And so I answered honestly, and we talked about ayahuasca, and he went home that night and um, was nauseous and purging the whole night. And it was as if ayahuasca was calling him. And this is now maybe five years later, and he is in a deep personal relationship with Grandmother Ayahuasca. And so he, he had no concept of the cosmology or any information, and yet it, it is literally as if she came into him. I do believe that increased awareness in connection with the plant teacher is possible in any moment. It's just that the plant dieta is specifically focused on the purification process, and especially with us Westerners, we have so many distractions and stimulus, and we're taking all these things in our bodies that are, that are disharmonious to having an open, clear channel, that once that's clear, then we can continue to have that relationship in any moment outside of the plant dieta. Thank you. Um, other questions right up here? Um, I'm struck in this whole conversation. I'm, I'm being drawn to this one plant in yes. the whole room here. <laughs> and uh, reflecting on Dennis's uh, making fun of us monkeys, and I'm you know, wondering maybe I should address the question to the, to the one plant here. <laughs> and, and, and pondering that, I've, I've really enjoyed going out to the park with these big old trees and how people come alive around them. Um, so my question is, what is my question? Um, well, I, gosh, I think I forgot my question. <laughs> <laughs> it has something to do with it. Well, I, 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 I guess I'm asking where, where um, how do we enter more deeply into uh, an experience of, of nature and plants, especially this conference being in New York City, we're so disconnected from nature, and if it's nature calling us to, to commune, can you, can you speak to um, how this is really more than, than about psychedelics, it's more about perhaps getting back to nature? Could you address that? Dennis, maybe you can, maybe you can talk about your foundation. Well, so, so basically you're saying how can we Foster this education, get more people interested. I'm inviting you to speak about really is this more about connecting to nature? Is this about connecting to nature? Oh. Neil. He's asking if it's not really about psychedelics per se, but a more fundamental connection to nature that, that we need to get back to. And that psychedelics are just a, a way to oh. do that. Well, yeah, I, th I think that's one of the things that we're learning from psychedelics, especially ayahuasca. It seems to be raising this uh, awareness in, uh, in certain segments of the population, people here, that our relationship to nature and all species on this planet, has, we have to uh, become more conscious about that and sort of re-accept the, the role uh, that we've abjured for 2,000 years or more, that we have to be protectors of nature. And, uh, you know, a big part of the problem that we're facing now existentially, the planetary environmental crisis, is that we haven't viewed nature that way. We have this delusion, which is a function of the, you know, sort of the corporate and capitalist and, and I dare say, you know, Judeo-Christian perspective that we own nature. And you know, and it exists for us to exploit and uh, and rape, literally. Well, we're busy doing that, but we have to change that perspective, or there won't be any nature. And uh, you know, we are part of nature. That's the fundamental thing uh, that I think psychedelics can can help us to re-understand. We're part of these homeostatic networks that keep the planet within certain parameters. And uh, we're doing our best to destabilize those things. We've got to, you know, and we have to spread the word. And, and ayahuasca and these other conferences like this and the medicines themselves are uh, one way to do that. Uh, it, it's a problem because they're prohibited in most places. 
Uh, so you can't just go selling them on the street or what? Well, you can, but you know, <laughs> don't want to take that risk. But I think it's interesting that ayahuasca is a plant. Obviously, it's a plant, and one of the things you can do with ayahuasca uh, is, you know, do what gardeners and plant people have always done: trade them across the back fence, teach people how to grow them, teach people how to prepare them. It doesn't have to be a commercial or capitalist thing. It's just plants want to spread. And, and look how far ayahuasca has come in just 30 years. It's, it's all over the world now. So uh, with reference to the monkeys, you know, we're, we are the monkeys, but we're carrying out ayahuasca's program more or less effectively in some ways. I mean, you also have to take a longer, uh, you know, you have to have a, a certain historical and even evolutionary perspective on these things. We're, we're impatient. We're an impatient species. We want change right away. But I think plants and plant complexes like ayahuasca work their magic over decades, centuries, sometimes even longer time frames. So, you know, we can, we can relax. It's, it's all good. It's all unfolding the way it should be. I think that one of the, uh, it's, it's one of the big questions about psychedelics in general is how, as, as many people, uh, many of the speakers have talked about, how to integrate the lessons that are learned. So if the lesson, you know, one of the lessons being learned is how to better connect to nature, how do hum, you know, humans connect to nature, I think that the really practical you know, starting places, connect to nature, sit under a tree, use the park, encourage the park, travel places that, that, that you can bond with, with the, the native side of other species and, and plants and animals. I mean, do what you feel like you should in terms of actually experiencing nature and encouraging, you know, good behavior of humans around natural things. <laughs> Be practical. Do it. Along those lines, a practical first step that at least I'm practicing every day is the plants that I am taking in my body through the food. So the plants being the embodiment of the sun, the moon, the earth, air, wind, fire, it's right there. And so we're, what we're eating and also the energy of the animals that we're taking into our body and becoming sensitive and feeling the differences of those energies will then I believe for myself and others, create more connection to all these other beings around us. Other questions? Oh, just one thing to add, and that in terms of relationship with plants, there's nothing quite like, like growing your own yes. plants or fungi, and you develop a very special relationship. Other questions for the panel? Somebody who has not asked a question yet. Sir. Hi, hi good evening. Um, my, my question is the Corona and the Cape, if you use it separately um, and you use the Sananga and the Rapé with it, it's a plant medicine. The tobacco and the Sananga is a plant medicine. But you use it separately in a three, four hour period. Did you guys hear the question? No. <laughs> okay. Let's get this question down. Could you repeat it again, please? Okay. The vine medicine? These are vine medicines he's asking you about. And the, 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 the leaf medicine? Yes, and the leaf medicine. Without mixing it. How do you, which, he's asking if you mix the vine medicine and the leaf medicine at the same time. You don't mix it, but you ingest it, but you follow it up with the hape, which is a tobacco medicine, and the sananga, which is a plant medicine also. Are you familiar with those medicines? So, Hapango is a tobacco medicine we ingest through the nose. And the sananga is an eye drop, which is from the root of a plant that we also drop in our eye. What, what culture is this, sir? The Amazon. From which part of the Amazon? From the northern Amazon. Northern Amazon. Do you? It's so hard to hear that, that we can only catch a few of the words, I, and if it's, 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 you can't tell the question. 
I think he wants to know if you combine vine medicine with uh, plant with leaf medicine like tobacco. And I've seen them used together, so I'm wondering if, if, you, if they're used together. The vine medicine and the oh, leaf medicine. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. I mean, tobacco is tobacco is very much often in the traditional you know use. Uh, tobacco plays a big role. Mapacho is used for cleansing, and uh, you know this strong Amazonian tobacco. You don't have to use tobacco with ayahuasca, but it's part of the tradition. And many other things. I mean, you know, and we think, well, tobacco is, is bad. It's bad for you. Well, in the first place, none of these things are bad. They don't, you know, it's how people use them that are bad. And, and if you use, uh, you know, tobacco ritually in the context of ceremony, you know, part of that is you probably don't want to smoke it all the time. And I, I know many ayahuasqueros, you know, they smoke like chimneys, but they've sort of taken on the the Western use of these things. In many places, uh, certain ones, they'll use it in ceremony and never use it outside ceremony. So it's uh, like anything that we consume, put into our body and, and so on. It's all about our behavior with respect to that substance. Not the substance, but our behavior determines whether that's a constructive use or a destructive use. Uh, and, and in the context of uh, of traditional vegetalismo uh, in Peru, they are immersed in a chemical uh, ecology. That's why there are all of these admixture plants that they might occasionally use or use in in uh, you know in conjunction with them. Their perception of being you know interacting with these plants is, I think, different than ours. You know because they're they're so immediate it's just part of their environment and uh, they have a different uh, sort of way of looking at interacting with uh, multiple substances you know most of the people in that are involved in vegetalismo and the mestizo population they depend on all these plant medicines for basic health care they don't have access to the kind of health care that we have access to oh sorry we don't have access to it <laughs> kind of health care that we might like to have access to. <laughs> anyway. Also, there, just a quick note, there's many layers of wisdom in terms of how the plants are combined. So for, and they all have their own, um, the, the plant spirits have their own characteristics. So for example, the Pino Blanco is known to be um, the, the light, very light uh, being and his brothers with the Pino Colorado and the two of them, um, you know, won't, won't want to be immersed with Ajo Sacha. So it's a very interesting way of combining certain ones for certain reasons and, and the, the teachings and, and their own dynamic that, that takes place, which the vegetalista is very well versed in. Yeah, and I think the same thing goes on, not dissimilar things go on in Chinese medicine for example, where the medicinal re remedies are multi-component remedies and, and who knows how they decide what goes well with what in terms of developing these remedies. But I think a lot of it has to do with organoleptic properties and how do they look and smell and how do they interact with the senses and it's based on a, you know, an intuition essentially. But the intuition is often a kind of a a wisdom of, of the response our bodies make to these plants through a sensory interaction. Anyway, I don't know if that makes sense, but I think that's part of the dynamic uh, that leads to it. Okay, we have a question over here. Uh, this question is about the placebo effect. Placebo effect? Or as my Let's friend at Harvard Medical calls, psychoneuroimmunoendocrinology. Uh, so you're familiar with the studies on morphine. You give subjects morphine for three days for pain relief. And then on the fourth day, you give them a placebo. And they still report pain relief. And the question is like, why? 
Uh, is there endogenous morphine at work? Well, if you repeat the same experiment and you, you give them blockers for endogenous morphine, then this placebo effect doesn't work. So we know that there's got to be some sort of expectation pathway going on where you're releasing your endogenous morphine. Now, this experiment also works on NZ and I believe a few others. So my question is, cool. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, we have endogenous DMT. Can we leverage this expectation pathway and can we induce placebo DMT experience in the same way? Well, I don't, has anyone here ever had a placebo DMT experience? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I think it's an oxymoron. I, I think, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I mean, it's possible. I, and it may be that, uh, you know, I mean, we, well, DMT is an example. We know that DMT occurs as part of our neurochemistry. Uh, under some conditions, you might be able to, you know, elicit increased synthesis of DMT. It's been suggested by Rick Strassman and others that it might be uh, stimulated during birth or during death, and that might have something to do with the near-death experience, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this idea. So theoretically, it's possible, but I, uh, is that a placebo DMT experience? Not really. It's an endogenous DMT experience. And, I mean, you know, you, you open up such a huge can of worms when you're talking about the placebo effect, because it, we don't understand the placebo effect. It's real. There may be mechanisms behind it that if we understood what they were, we wouldn't call it the placebo effect. Uh, you know, it's a term that, it's a loaded term. It's, uh, you know, a better term might be unanticipated effects, uh, you know. So, and when it comes to psychedelics, it's just hard to, to really sort that out. I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> so is anyone number, familiar with forms on the left? Right? The line forms on the left. <laughs> is anyone familiar with such a study? No. no. What's that? I would say, is anyone familiar with such a study having been done about the placebo effect being used to generate a psychedelic experience? Has anyone dreamt of, of a psychedelic experience? Well, I, I think that a point, I, I, don't, I don't know of anyone who has tried the DMT experiment, but w one of the things that I would point out is that some, in some of the recent psychedelic research, they're using an active placebo, um, like the Johns Hopkins folks, the first one they used Ritalin, mm -hmm. and they, they, the uh, sitters, the guides, were blind to whether or not there, there was psilocybin being administered or not. And they didn't actually know what the active placebo was going to be, although they knew there was going to be one. And some of the counseling sessions, some of the sitting sessions that they did where people got the riddle and they actually had fairly profound experiences. And so they, while the sitters were largely able to guess when the people got the high dose psilocybin, um, they guessed wrong. Um, the very, very experienced uh, psychedelic trip sitters slash guides got, it, got the, the question wrong uh, uh, of whether or not the person had received L psilocybin or or the active placebo. So people definitely can have, with the right environment and the right, uh, you know, set and setting and all that, uh, pretty strong internal experiences without having to take a psych psychedelic. Other comments? Okay. Uh, questions? Other questions? Miss? Yes. And uh, I've been doing, um, I've been researching <laughs> for many months about psychedelic community and then just the visionary, visionary plant. And, uh, and then also I've been watching, I've been um, experiencing art for many decades, so, like uh, everything, literature and music and dance and then just uh, uh, fine art. But uh, just um, Rachel said it's ineffable. The experience is ineffable. <laughs> but, uh, 
Yes, mystic, you know, the mystic experience, spiritual experience is always ineffable, but as a human being, we always try to express and to communicate in such a way to heal people, to help people, to, I mean, just eliminate their, to help their, them to eliminate their stress. So, I mean, until now, question is, I mean, uh, artists and musicians have been producing uh, artwork, cultural work, based on their just uh, psychedelic experience. But, um, the, I mean, for example, in visual, visual art, uh, Alex Gray, and it's like a, it's like became, it's been becoming like stereotypical visual expression. expression. But uh, it's very complicated. So, I mean, art, the psychedelic experience can be limited to that kind of visual, I mean, visual expression of Alex Gray's style. Or in music, Shipungo is fantastic. I mean, he's, he's um, you yeah, ask question, is that your, ask question is that your feeling about cultural activity based on psychedelic experience. Yes. I, I'd like to talk about, um, in, in one of the Pablo Amaringo books, there are two now with these large color plates, uh, he talks about when he's painting, he's singing the acaros as he's painting. So he says he's instilling in the artwork itself the energy and experience. And he recommends that if you have one of his paintings that you cover it for three months, he says, and then prepare yourself in a meditative way to uncover it and receive the impact of the energy. Okay. So, um, visual expression of uh, psychedelic just yes. experience, it's like a little bit just restricting humans' imagination. So it could be varied, you know, um, um, because um, because it we we need to open people's expectation and then just uh, let them imagine in their own way. Okay. So is, <laughs> She's suggesting that, that art is a way of expressing oneself with psychedelics and that we need to use psychedelic experience to be more in touch with the creative process and wanted you to comment on that. I have two comments. The first is, um, does anyone remember the slide, the first slide of the big serpent in my presentation? Yes. Yeah. So, that came directly from an uh, ayahuasca ceremony vision that I had, so I painted it. And the little white person in the middle, the little, yeah, lost in the belly there person was me. And so what happened was I painted that and then I had a dream about it and then the dream led into the vision which then created another visual that then I painted that. And so the other comment is that in the Shipibo tradition, the women artists are just, are considered very important in their culture in connection with the Ayahuascaros because what will happen is the Ayahuascaros will share the story of what they saw in the vision to these artists, the, you know the women who create these beautiful tapestries? And so the women are gifted and able to transmit that vision into the material physical realm making these this art which then the Iowa scare is like yes and then that feeds back that energy to the Iowa scare and it continues on there's this like dynamic relationship between the two so the women are considered very important in terms of that expression any other comments all right we have time for one more question this gentleman's been waiting very patiently Sir. Thanks. Um, I was wondering with each of you, what has most um, surprised and educated you listening to the others this weekend? What, what is the most surprised? What, when have you been the most surprised and or educated during this weekend? By, the, by your colleagues, by your fellow speakers. <laughs> I 
Yeah, I, I, one thing that I noticed, it wasn't a specific thing, but it was that so many people have been speaking about love. And I think that's really significant. And the opening of the heart, and, and it's been expressed in many, many, many different ways. And, and that, to me, profoundly surprised me and delighted me. So. But I would say, why does it surprise you that it's about <laughs> love? <laughs> no, I, I mean, just historically thinking about these conferences and the, the general, the themes that emerge, and, and, and it was just wonderful. I mean, I mean, surprised in a delighted way, not in a I'm Delight. shocked way. But. Come on, panel. I'm going to let you squirm a little bit. Any other comments about learning? We have no time for other questions, but I, I wondered. I, I think I've, I've really been awed by the, the healing power of the mystical experience in everybody's report. And, uh, you know, I understand there's a lot of mystery around the dynamics of how it works and all those questions. But I've just the impact feels like awe of how healing uh, that experience is and how it shifts our orientation in the world and in relation to our own lives and our own death. Thank you. Any other comments before we close down? Any last words of wisdom? Well, I, I think this is a little bit of a cop-out, but um, the, one of the things that always strikes me at these conferences is that many people in the audience or, or who come are as uh, informed as the people who are speaking and it's a, it, very interesting to just interact with everybody who's here um, and it, I'm always uh, uh, despite having come to many conferences um, I'm always surprised how uh, much there is to learn from the people who attend um, and how interesting the things that they're doing are and the things that they have to talk about yeah. here here yes. I'm inspired by everyone's heart-centered exploration in this area and just if I feel um, like reconnected with soul family so it's just really um, heartening to know that we're all in this together we are indeed well I think on that note let's thank the panelists our speakers That is so beautiful. We all love you. And we love you too. See you next year.